when it's dark and everything is quiet, you're not alone. Evil spirits are looking for any opportunity to harass you, to harm you, and to take over your life. This world is a strange one. These are 10 allegedly true ghost stories from my bonus episode series. That series is only available first to my patrons. There are nearly 50 altogether. But I lost my voice this weekend and I'm slowly getting it back. Well, I was screaming in terror. No joke. My fiance and I randomly woke up at three in the morning, screaming our lungs out, racing for the light switch. I was so scared, I couldn't go back to sleep and I was too afraid to turn off any of the lights, let alone turn my back to anything. I have no idea why we both woke up screaming simultaneously. It was creepy and strange. So my voice is out for a few days. As such, enjoy these creepy ghost stories. If you want to be a patron to unlock shoutouts, bonus stories, and exclusive merchandise and goodies, you can check out patreon.com slash darkness prevails. Enjoy, guys. There's no outro this time. So here are your stories. This was a scary paranormal occurrence for me as a kid. I recently turned 13, and about three weeks after my birthday, my neighbors had to move out for family issues. We didn't have any neighbors for about a week. When I was playing basketball in my front yard, I saw a large moving van pull up next to our driveway. I looked up only to see a girl that looked about my age. She hopped right out of the back seat. She catches me staring at her and I quickly look away. She walks up to me, introducing herself as Sasha. I tell her my name and we begin to talk. Suddenly, I hear a loud and fierce voice yell over to us, Sasha. I look up and a man that looks wasted and too drunk to drive walks right over. He says he's Sasha's dad and yanks her away from us. I didn't think too much of it, and I went back to playing basketball. Soon after that, I'm inside playing Minecraft. About 10 minutes later, I hear a knock on my bedroom window. Not a pound knock, but a small tap, tap, tap. My family owns a two-story house, so curious, I go over to investigate. You see, my room's on the second floor. No one should be able to tap on my window. I go over to it and of course there's nothing there, just a sheer drop. So I try to ignore it. Maybe something fell off a nearby tree and brushed up against the window. But a minute later, I hear the knock again. By then, I'm starting to freak out. I get up and go to close the curtains. But as I look out the window before I close the curtains, I saw a whitish looking substance fly off into the distance. I'm speechless, but it only makes me close my curtains even faster. I get ready for bed and go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night when I hear another tapping coming from the exact same window as before. I grab my phone and look at the time. It's three in the morning, exactly. I've watched a lot of paranormal things and I know perfectly well that 3 a.m. is the devil's hour. I try to ignore the knocking again and go back to sleep. In the morning, I get up and everything from last night comes back to me. I go over to check the window. I really wasn't expecting anything, but when I opened the curtains, I saw something written in red. I don't know if it was paint or markers or something like that, but it clearly said, why didn't you open? Immediately, I called my mom and dad to come see this. My mom freaked out when she saw it, but my dad seemed a little too calm. I don't think he believed that it wasn't me that did it. He said that if it happened again to tell us. After that, the day went by pretty normal. I was playing basketball again in my front yard when I saw Sasha. Sasha was waving me over to her yard. I ran over asking her what was wrong. She said, did you hear that knock on your window too? Now I was really surprised. Yeah, I did. How did you know? I asked her. She stared blankly at me. I didn't know if I should walk away or if I should ask her what's wrong. At that very second, I heard my mom call to me to come inside. So I said bye to Sasha, but she never responded. I quickly ran inside. Later that night, I was playing more games. As if on cue, I heard the same knock on my window as before, except it was louder. 
Now it sounded like someone was deliberately knocking on my window, as if wanting me to open it or look outside. I whipped out my phone and began taking a voice recording of the sound. I recorded the knocking and called my dad. I played it back for him. All the background noise was there, but for some reason, the knocking wasn't. I sat there on the bed, puzzled, looking speechlessly at my phone. I thought maybe it was glitching or something, so I powered it down and quickly restarted it. Even after doing that, all I could hear was static from the recording. I was extremely puzzled, and I went to bed. And again, I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of knocking at my window, and of course, it was three in the morning. I did not make any movement. I just laid there in the bed facing away from the window. For you to really understand the story, the layout of my room is pretty simple. When getting an aerial view, my door is on the top left-hand corner, and my closet occupies the whole left wall. I have a couch occupying the whole right wall, and my bed occupies the top row. So the window is directly across from my bed. If you roll over, you would see my window. I hear one loud last knock, and now I'm so stressed out that I just roll over. When I roll over, I get a shock that still haunts me to this day. I could have seen an owl, a bird, or some kind of creature, but the one thing I didn't expect to see at my window was Sasha. My eyes widened, and we just continued to stare at each other for a few seconds, and those seconds felt like hours. When I finally pulled my eyes away from Sasha, I looked down and realized her wrists were cut deeply. The wounds were so deep that there was blood gushing from them. I see some of the blood on her finger and her finger is pressed up against the window. Before I can get up and reach for my phone to take a video, Sasha lets out a sound, the sound of an inhuman scream, like a mixture of a bunch of different dying animals at the same time. I look at Sasha. She leaps off my window and vanishes. The next day, I see a moving van in front of Sasha's house. I see Sasha's dad, and I see Sasha get into the van they came in, and they pull away. The moving truck follows. I never understood what happened that very night, and I honestly hope to never truly know. This story happened five years ago when I was nine, and ever since then, I've been experiencing hallucinations and I'm hearing voices. With that being said, let me start. I was camping with my family in the woods of Germany for three nights. It was a campground and we took a spot next to a large river. Nearby, there was also a bridge around seven meters high that crossed that river and the entrance to an old style town. The moment we arrived though, I suddenly felt a sense of terror and I began to get nauseous and really sick. The first day everybody spent setting up. I was sick in the car though, crying because I was in so much pain. However, as night began to approach, I miraculously felt better. I don't know if that has anything to do with what I would later see, but it definitely put me on edge as I had trouble sleeping all night. While I lay on my mattress trying to sleep, I remember shaking for some reason, even though I was sweating because it was so warm. The next morning, I woke up late, and I didn't remember falling asleep. As I was walking over to the rest of my family, I looked over to the bridge nearby, and I saw on it a skinny black dog. I could clearly see the thing's ribcage, but I couldn't see its head or front legs. It walked along the bridge, but it wasn't really walking. It was more like a kind of slow gallop. It would take small steps hopping from left to right. I watched it cross the bridge and I told my family what I'd seen. They of course didn't believe me or they didn't care about some dog. The only person who really took interest was my cousin. Let's call her Bella. Bella said we should go look for it. And I said, being my nine-year-old self, that that was a good idea. So we did. We jogged over to the spot where I saw the dog and Bella brought a whistle for some reason. We were young and had no idea what we were doing. We came up with this idea that we would stand back to back. She would blow the whistle every time she saw it. 
I turned around and she immediately blew the whistle. I turned around again, but there was nothing there. So I asked, uh, where'd you see it? Behind that house, she replied. I turned back around and the same thing happened again and another time. I was beginning to think Bella was just messing with me. So when we stood back to back, I turned my head around and looked at the same place she was. That way, what she was seeing, I would see. But then she never blew her whistle. I decided we would check behind the house and we did, but we found nothing. Though the whole time, I felt like I was being watched. While I was looking, Bella pulled my shirt and pointed at a window. I turned to see glowing red eyes and we booked it out of there. Creeped out, we ran back to the campground and we didn't say anything to the adults. We just carried on pretending nothing had happened. At the end of the day, the two of us decided to play hide and seek. Behind the river was a cornfield and we thought it would be fun to play over there. So the two of us got my uncle and two brothers to come with us. Then we all walked across the bridge together. We ended up passing that house and I could still see the red eyes inside, but I didn't say anything. I was trying not to be scared. We started playing and I hid deep into the cornfield. I thought it'd be a good hiding spot. I hid at the edge of the field and at the beginning of the nearby forest, as far away from the seeker as possible but still close to the river. I could still see the campground across the bridge from here. It was about five minutes after the seeker started trying to find us and he already found the first person and I could see them maybe 30 meters or so away. But then I began to hear the sound of sniffing, the way a dog sniffs when it's found something. And then right after that came this hyena-like cackle. Instantly I turned and I saw red eyes right upon me. I ran as fast as I could into my uncle's arms and I begged him to take us back to the campground. So we called the game quits and we went back and we left the next evening after. I later found out that at that very same camping site, someone got drunk and drove right into the water, drowning. Maybe that death has something to do with what I've been seeing. And also, ever since then, I've been seeing a lot of things recently, which make me think of this encounter. Every so often, I see something that resembles either a cat or a fox running up and down the steps outside my window, trying to keep me up all night. I don't know if I'm going crazy or if I'm being followed by some spirit. If I had any words of advice to leave you with, it would be to always trust your gut feeling and leave the area if it comes to you. I'm 33 years old. My husband and I have three kids still at home. The other two are technically adults. We have three cats and a dog as well. Molly's my cat and sleeps with me every night, generally on my legs as I lay on my stomach. Molly is a very quiet cat. I've only ever heard her hiss once, and we'll get to that in a moment. You see, for the last week or two, I've been seeing what appears to be a figure standing down my hallway, either coming or going from my bedroom, which sits at the end of that hallway. One particular night, as Molly and I were getting situated in bed, I saw movement from the corner of my eye. It looked to be a shadow coming up to my side of the bed. My husband was already in bed and the kids had been asleep for a couple of hours. About the same time I see this shadow coming through the doorway, Molly goes nuts. She basically wraps her paws around my leg and begins to hiss and growl while looking at the doorway. That led my husband to ask, what's going on? To which I reply, I think Molly and I just saw something. I literally heard him roll his eyes as he goes back to sleep. I reach down to pet Molly and tell her that everything is going to be okay and to lay back down. It took a few minutes for her fur to go back to normal and since that night, I've sensed something in my room. So fast forward to the other night. My dumb ass is looking around on the app store and I see the Ouija board app. I think, what the hell, it's free, so why not? 
I thought maybe at the very least, I could connect with this shadow or ghost being and find out what it wants. Maybe I could at least get a name. Sounds innocent enough, right? So the app downloaded and I read through the rules. I've never messed with the Ouija board, but I've listened to stories and I know the basics. Before I clicked on the button to start the session, I said a little prayer just in case. At first, I started out in the living room where my husband was passed out on the couch because he was sick at the time. There was nothing. So I walk on over to the laundry room, which is on the opposite side of the house from my bedroom. And still, there was nothing. I then get the bright idea to go to my bedroom. As soon as I asked if anyone else was there, the planchette spelled out, need help. So I asked, do you need help? Then it spelled out, need proof, question mark. While I laid on my bed thinking, what the hell? Molly and my other cat, Jax, came running up onto the bed and literally got right in my face between my eyes and my phone. I moved them over to get them out of the way and I giggled and replied with, no, I don't need proof. At that time, the app began to flash and an alert came on that said, angry spirit, say goodbye now. So that's what I did, and I closed the app. Now, on the app, when you successfully say goodbye, it goes to an ad. Luckily, I was able to end the session. At that time, I decided to occupy my mind with something else, as I didn't know whether to be freaked out or to think that that was all faked by the app to get you to continue to use it. I wasn't sure. I waited a couple of hours and decided to use it again. This time, I started in my bedroom. I asked if anyone was there, and there was no response. I should mention that for the first few moments, I was sitting up on my bed facing the door, which had been wide open. Since I wasn't getting any responses, I decided to lay back down, as last time I'd got responses then, and again it worked. I asked, is anyone here? And I got a yes. I asked, what's your name? And it spelled out Rosa. I asked, how old are you? And got the response of, Anne, so maybe there were two spirits here. I asked about that, and whatever I was talking to said no. So I asked again to be sure, who is here? The response was, want proof? So this time I asked, what kind of proof? And the next response scared the hell out of me. It responded with, demon, I got chills. I said, no thank you, goodbye. And the session successfully ended. I sat there thinking about how insane this is, wondering that no way in the world can this be real. It, it can't be real, right? I mean, it's just an app on my phone. After a few hours and a few funny YouTube videos, I later fell asleep. My husband is still in the living room on the couch since he needs to be set up so he can breathe easier. It's just me in my room. Molly is missing in action, so I was completely alone. Throughout that whole night, I would feel like someone was pushing down on the pillows by my head. I ended up waking up around 5.30 in the morning and I just decided to stay awake. Even still, I kept feeling someone's weight pushed down on my husband's side of the bed. Finally, after about 10 minutes of this, and after seeing no one or nothing that could be doing this, I finally said to leave me alone out loud and it noticeably stopped. I still have that app on my phone I've been debating about whether or not I should try it again. Needless to say, I'm still a bit hesitant as I'm not sure what will happen. I'm not sure if it's real or if it's just something the app does on its own. If anyone else has experience with this app, what have you experienced, if anything? Maybe you've seen something crazy like I have. About 10 years ago, I was going through a bad time in my life. I was very depressed and found myself just driving around to different places. Sometimes I'd stop at little random stores or bars and try to start up conversations with random people. I just needed to get out of my own mind. I ended up meeting the owner of one of these stores through my wanderings. Let's call him Dave. We would drink coffee, play chess, chain smoke, and talk about music and life. Dave was a cool guy. I think he knew that I just needed a distraction and some company. 
and he was very happy to accommodate me. One day, our conversation came to creepy experiences we'd had. I had told him about the weird house I grew up in, which prompted him to bring up the woods. There's a lake not too far, maybe 30 minutes drive from where we were. The lake was a huge quarry back in the 40s that had been turned into a reservoir in the 70s and 80s. Not too important. What is important is the history of tragedy, both on the lake and when the site was a quarry. The area was apparently some native land at one point in time as well. Dave described going out to a specific point in those woods skirting the lake. He would go with a group of friends that wanted to try and coax spirits out. Dave told me how a strange fog would roll in out of nowhere. There would be noises and other strange things. People would get touched by something and he relayed his feelings of being followed through the woods. He made it clear that he had no intention of ever going back. According to him, he and many others that had went there began having trouble at home after a few visits in those woods. It took me a few tries to get Dave to give me directions to the place. He drew me a map for the last leg of the journey, as you have to go through a few stretches of unmarked dirt roads to get there. I was honestly so adamant of getting directions because his story was so remarkable to me and he seemed so genuinely unsettled while telling me about it. I was just too curious. As the sun began to go down, Dave and I parted ways and I got back in my truck. I decided, even with Dave's warnings, that I would venture into those woods and see for myself. I had just about everything in my truck I would need to go into the woods by myself. Boots, flashlights, batteries, water, and a jacket for the cool September night. I was ready so I headed out. Now, I will say that yes, going out to the woods by myself was stupid. I knew that going in, but I'm a hunter, a hiker, and a camper. I go out in the woods all the time, and I wasn't planning on staying all night, nor is the site out in the middle of nowhere, because there's civilization about a mile or two down the road. So I got to the point in my journey where I had to use the directions drawn for me. I could see just how secluded this area was. It went from being a house every 50 yards to every 100, then the house has stopped altogether, and it was just dirt road and trees. And then I saw it, the two gates. One gate led to a campground on the left, the other to the woods where I would soon regret entering. I parked my truck, grabbed my stuff, and headed over to the gate. On the gate, there was a keep out sign. It was obviously very old and worn, the path behind the gate was long and winding and had a steep downward angle. Ignoring the sign, I started down the path, moving my flashlight from left to right, then down to keep an eye on my footing. I must have been 200 yards down the path when a group of deer startled me and I them. The cool breeze on my face helped me compose myself and continue on. Finally, the path leveled out and I came to the right turn that Dave had said should be there. Then the clearing about 100 feet further the clearing had a steep rise into a heavily wooded area to the right, and a flatter and still tree-laden area near the lake to my left. I decided to rest for a bit and get acclimated to the woods for a while in the clearing. I clicked off my light and lit a cigarette. I was careful to cover the cherry of my smoke to try and let my eyes adjust. I was probably sitting there for about 20 minutes before I had my first sense of unease. On the way down, there were the usual noises of the woods, Animals, bugs, the wind, you know, forest sounds. I noticed all of a sudden that I'd been sitting in almost complete silence besides my own movement. I also noticed the complete lack of air movement, almost like I was sitting in a cold, dark basement. The silence was unnatural and wrong. With the hairs on the back of my neck at full attention, I clicked my light on, and in front of and all around me, a white fog had come out of nowhere. This wasn't your typical fog either. It was only about a foot thick and stuck low to the ground. Against my better judgment, I turned the light off and leaned back against the stump I was on, using it as a backrest. As I sat there listening to nothing, I could first hear then feel the zipper on my jacket move slightly on its own, like something was gently tapping it side to side. I tensed up, only for the cloth end of my zipper to be pushed up to my chin. Freaked out, I jumped up, clicked on my light, and tried to make sense of it. A bug, not that I can find. Wind, maybe, but there was none. 
a little creeped out at this point, and decided to head a little further down the path. Again, I knew this was a bad idea. The path headed back uphill to another part of the woods. The path began to narrow, and ahead of me, there was a very narrow line through a thick growth of trees that I didn't have the courage to press through. I was already dreading my walk back through the strange fog. Deciding to calm my nerves, I lit another smoke. Well, I attempted to anyway. As I lit my lighter, the flame shot over to the left, as if a strong wind had pushed it over. Again, there was no wind. I felt nothing on my hands. I shrugged it off and struck again. This time, it laid over to the right. It was like I had held my hand out of a moving car window. I could hear the flame roaring against whatever force was forcing it over. Then, I heard it. At first, I thought I was hearing a branch fall from a tree. As my mind was rationalizing the noise, I realized the limb had been falling and falling and now sounded as if it were coming towards me rather than falling down. I could hear the branch, if that's what it was, hitting other limbs and smacking tree trunks as it passed behind me and then around my front. I panicked. I, I couldn't move. I grabbed my knife from my pocket and got ready to defend myself. Then I heard the laughter. One, two, then three different people laughing up the hill to my right. The laughter echoed through the cool night air. The voices just laughed, laughs that sounded more unstable than happy. Gazing towards the sounds, I saw what appeared to be a figure holding a lantern about 20 yards into the thick woods. The light coming in and out as the figures moved through the woods, the pale orange light barely illuminated what looked like three dark figures. At that moment, I turned and ran. I ran as fast as I could, almost outrunning the light of my flashlight, it seemed. As I came back into the clearing, I fell on my chest hard. I had caught my boot on a fallen log and knocked the wind right out of me. Thankfully, during the fall, I threw my knife instead of letting it stab me. My flashlight lay just out of my reach, so gasping, I crawled towards the still-lit flashlight. As my hand grabbed hold of it, another flurry of laughter and falling stick noises erupted to my left, this time all too close. A small thicket of bushes moved as my light came up, as if someone or something had slipped back into concealment. I was done. I power walked towards the path that had brought me in. The noises had ceased, but I wouldn't turn around to look. I, I couldn't. As I came to the bend, something on the ground caught my eye. In a bare patch of dirt free of leaves, there were two distinct handprints in the damp earth. Handprints that looked like they dug their fingers into the ground as they were being dragged away. I hadn't seen them on the way in, and they looked fresh. Again, I was running up the long steep hill and hearing all manner of noises behind me as I did. Between my crunches and breathing, I could hear cruel grunts and noises that sounded like anger that couldn't be put into words. I ran and ran until I could see my truck reflecting through the sparse trees. I fumbled to unlock my doors and start my truck. I instantly hit my high beams to cast light down the hill. There was nothing there, not a soul. But a second later, I could see two yellow dots peek around a large tree 50 yards down. For a moment, they held my gaze, then disappeared back behind the tree. Throwing my truck into reverse, I drove backwards until I got to the first turn out of the woods. I drove forward onto the first of many dirt roads out of the place. I drove faster and faster, feeling as if I was still running for my life. I could feel a force bearing down on my back and neck, as if I was being chased by something still, like something had latched onto me. Finally, I hit asphalt, and I drove as fast as I could until I saw headlights from another vehicle. I kept driving until I was home, not even taking the time to light a cigarette during the hour plus ride. I just drove in silence. That feeling of being latched onto returns to me all too often, especially when I think about my night in those woods. Writing this gives me a sense of being watched even now. I will never return to those woods, and I'll never tell a soul how to get there. I've come into contact with things that I believe are paranormal ever since I was 13. I often heard knocks and voices when no one was there. I've even had things thrown at me, and I've woke up on a couple of occasions 
with cuts all over my body. We moved away from that house though when I was 15. But my scariest experiences happened in our current house when my parents weren't home. They were out on a two day vacation to get some alone time and everything was pretty calm. I was sitting on the couch one day watching episodes of The Walking Dead and take note that this happened in 2013. My cat was lying next to me making a soft snoring sound as she slept. Everything seemed peaceful. Everything seemed normal when there was a sudden knock on my door. At the same time, me and my cat quickly moved our head towards the front door to get a look. Then there was another knock and another they were slow, but very loud. This was bizarre because my parents left this morning. They were going to be in a whole different state. If it was anyone, it was probably the neighbor. So I got up and went to the door and I looked out the peak hole. It was still dark out, so I wasn't able to see much, but I could very obviously see a girl just outside my door. I was able to make out her blonde hair and she was wearing a blue galaxy sweatshirt. Right away, I was stunned because that was exactly what I was wearing, and my hair was blonde as well. A little creeped out, I opened the door, but no one was out there. I mean, the little girl I had just seen was somehow completely gone without a trace. I stepped outside still, looking around for the girl with the blonde hair, but of course, I saw no one. I went back inside slowly, and I made sure to lock the door. I continued to keep watching The Walking Dead with my cat on high alert. I started thinking about what had happened. Was it my imagination? If it was, then why did my cat hear it too? Soon everything was quiet again, the only noise being the TV. It went on like this for about 10 more minutes until I heard the same knocking, but from the back door this time. It was the same pattern and loudness of the knocks before slow, yet very audible. Now, the back door is in the kitchen and our couch was set in front of the kitchen, so when you look behind you, you can very clearly see the back door. Our back door was see-through, glass was on the inside and there was a protective screening on the outside. But when I looked at the back door, I screamed because that was the same girl with the blonde hair and the blue galaxy sweatshirt. But that wasn't what scared me so. It was because she looked exactly like me. It was like I was over there behind the back door, knocking slowly. I saw her smile so big her cheeks were starting to rip. It was disturbing to see me do that. She moved her hand to the outside handle and began to try to open the door. Thankfully, it was locked. I was petrified in horror watching this clone of myself she began to scream. She even sounded like me until her voice got deep and crackly as if she had a hoarse throat. Then the screaming died down and she spoke. She spoke in the most inhuman, terrifying voice I have ever heard. Let me in, let me in. I was horrified. This girl, it no longer sounded like me. My cat was now going crazy, growling at this thing. The creature who looked like me, she continued to beg to be let inside. I didn't want any more of this. I grabbed my cat and ran upstairs to my room. I locked every door behind me and I sat on the floor next to my bed. Then the worst happened. I heard a loud crash of broken glass downstairs and as soon as I heard it, I began to hyperventilate. I was crying a river of tears. My cat was now scratching at the door, growling at whatever was outside. Then there was a knock on my door, the same all too familiar knock, and then a different voice, yet still familiar. Sweetie, let me in. Whatever it was was now trying to sound like my mom, but I know it wasn't her. The voice wasn't perfect, and it was still far from human. She said it one more time, and the knocking got louder and faster. Soon it all faded, and everything went quiet again. I waited a few hours, and everything was still quiet. Soon I gathered enough courage to open my door. The TV was still playing, 
and I go downstairs and the house was completely trashed. Everything was out of place, and the back door in the kitchen was shattered to pieces. My cat was behind me. I looked over to the couch and there she was, me, sitting on the love seat, staring at me, smiling that broken smile. I ran for the front door, but the girl laughed maniacally. I opened the door and ran outside, and remembering my cat, I looked behind me. That was a bad idea. Following behind me was my cat, but following the both of us was that thing. I ran faster all the way to my neighbor's house and I pounded on the door, never looking back behind me again. My neighbor couldn't open the door fast enough. I rushed my way inside without a word and she shut the door and asked me what was wrong. I told her what I saw and I don't think she believed me. All she replied was, honey, do you know how late it is? But luckily she let me sleep over at her house. The next day, although hesitant, I went back to my home and I was confused because the place was totally fine. Inside was how it always looked. Nothing was out of place or broken. The screen door was normal again and the TV was even still on. And from then on, everything was fine again. The only weirdness I experienced were a few knocks on the door here and there, but never did I go investigate again. Nothing similar has ever happened after this. And I never told my parents about what happened because I know they think I was crazy and they would no longer trust me to be home alone. Now that I'm older, some sick part of me hopes to see it again to at least find out what that thing was, the thing that looked exactly like me. Ever since I was a small child, I've always seen shadow people. At first, I wasn't scared, but as I grew older, I realized that I was wrong. The first time that I saw one, I was around six years old. I was downstairs watching old shows with my grandpa, who had fallen asleep during Laverne and Shirley. Everyone else was asleep at the time. It was maybe 10 at night. I was leaning against my sleeping grandpa when I noticed something looking at me. This thing was short with huge round eyes. It looked like a child with a black sheet thrown over it, like a cheap Halloween costume. I waved a hello in its direction. Then in response, it immediately ran upstairs. Being a kid with an active imagination, I didn't really think much of it then. The next afternoon, I told my mom what I saw. She gave me a strange look and told me to draw what I'd seen. After drawing the little ghost, I proudly handed it to my mom, who immediately turned white. Are you sure you saw this? I nodded yes right away, and she said that when she was a little girl, she would see the same ghost. Another time when I was 15 years old, I was in bed around one in the morning and I could not fall asleep. I noticed the same lamppost outside my second floor window was flickering, which was weird because that never really happened. I closed my eyes, but I felt I was being watched. I reopened my eyes and saw that there was a shadow reaching closer to me across the ceiling. Each time the lamppost went off and on, the shadow had gotten bigger and longer and closer to my bed. I threw a blanket over my head, much like a child, and told the shadow man to leave me alone. Moments later, I peeked out from my blanket and it was gone. I took a deep breath in and out in a sigh of relief. I looked back at the window, then choked. The shadow man was against my window, small angry red eyes glaring at me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. Then I moved to turn on the light, but my ceiling fan crashed to the floor, just barely missing my head. The most recent time was when I was house and dog sitting for my mother-in-law. She was gone for the weekend and requested that me and my husband watched her dog. My husband, we can call him Peter, had fallen asleep on the couch with the dog. 
I got up from next to him to go to the bathroom. The hallway leading to the bathroom was dark. I had to grope the wall looking for the light switch and got a very queasy, uneasy feeling. When I finally brushed the switch, I saw those same small, angry red eyes peering at me from the upper left corner of the hallway. I switched the light on and jumped over the couch and next to Peter. What the hell, he said groggily and confused. Just when I was about to tell him what I saw, the nearly blind dog was barking nonstop. We got up to see that she was barking at the far left corner of the hallway, exactly where I saw it. Eight months later after that, the same dog still barks at that corner. Even now at 26 years old, I still see those shadow people at work, at school, at home. Anywhere that has a dark corner or an unlit room, they seem to be there waiting for me, as if they want me to know that I'm at their mercy. My story happens many years ago, but is still very fresh in my mind. I don't recall exactly how old I was, but it was before my teenage years. I enjoyed doing tin work with my mom during the summer. It gave me something constructive to do. So eagerly, I packed up a book, my baseball cap, and my disposable camera, then set off with my mother. She worked for the county as the foreman, and basically had to hold her workers' hands to get things done. Well, our task at hand today was a recovered truck that lumber yards used to haul material. It had been stolen and drove off onto a dead-end country road in the middle of the National Forest. We were there all day while the workers cleaned up all the material that had been left behind, the stuff that had once been loaded onto the truck. Everything was going great until young me really had to use the ladies' room and we were far from anything like that. So my mother told me to go far enough into the woods that no one could see me, but that I could still hear them so that I couldn't get lost. Thinking back, this still gives me chills. If I would have known I wasn't going to be alone, I never would have stepped foot into those woods. Before I walked off into the forest, something possessed me to grab my camera. After I did, I headed off into the trees, I wandered for a little while until I found the perfect spot. I did my business, and when I was done, there was something memorable about the tree I had just used to balance on. So I grabbed my camera and I snapped a quick photo. As I stepped back, I realized that the whole area I was standing in was just as captivating. So I snapped a few more photos and headed back for the truck. Well, by the end of the day, I'd used all my shots on my disposable camera and I really wanted to get them developed. So as a treat for being awesome, mom took me down to Walmart and had my camera developed. As I began to flip through the pictures, I came across the first picture, the picture of the tree I'd been balancing on. Only now there was a dog sitting there, staring straight into my camera. It was very much a dog, I was sure of that, even though I had been completely alone by that tree. But in this photo, the dog was a haze of blue and see-through. It appeared to be a German shepherd, but I couldn't be sure. My heart jumped when I saw it, and I was afraid to keep looking, but I forced myself to. My next photo was of a fallen tree next to me, and leaning against that tree was a small boy. The child, just like the dog, was staring straight back into the camera. I was terrified by this point, I've always believed in the paranormal, and this, this confirmed it for me. It was so chilling to look back at these images that I quickly put the photos away and I tried my best to forget about them. A week or so later, I walked into the living room and my dad was flipping through the pictures and his look had me confused. My dad doesn't believe in the paranormal at all, but he held up the picture of the boy. Then he said to me, Why'd you take a picture of Jesse? And why is Jesse behind the tree? He asked me where I took the picture. When I heard him, I froze in my tracks. 
Jesse is my cousin. Finally, I gathered my strength and I replied to him, what are you talking about? That's not Jesse. He argued with me for a moment and I finally told him, dad, I was alone in those woods when I took those pictures. Whoever's in that photo looks like Jesse's twin, but I can assure you, I was completely alone. He rolled his eyes and put the pictures down. Of course, he didn't believe me, but my mom did, and she recognized the pictures I'd taken that day. I've always felt that there was someone watching, and now I know that there really was. I work as an MICT, or paramedic, on Oahu, Hawaii. Back when I was an EMT working for city and county EMS, I had a coworker named Charlene. She has since moved on to working other fields, but back when she was working city EMS, she had a few encounters involving seeing ghosts. If there were ever a superhero ability that I didn't want, this would easily make the list. In one instance, she was practicing her violin outside the old Aya ambulance crew quarters at Polly Momi Hospital. The old crew quarters were the last door on the left down a dead end hallway. She saw two children run past her to the end of the hall where they then simply vanished. Supposedly the hospital was built over sacred ground and back in the days prior to Western contact, there was a huge tree standing there the ancient Hawaiians would bring dying family members here to pass on, and often the dying people would see the minehune, or dwarf-sized people that weren't usually visible. They would be sitting high up in the branches of the tree. Later, after the hospital was built, nurses would complain about kids running through the halls on the second floor after visiting hours. Of course, nobody could ever find these children, and the second floor is probably about the height of the branches the Minehune were seen in during ancient times. Charlene probably saw them too in that hallway. Another instance occurred on the midnight shift at the Hawaii Kai unit. EMS shares a station with HFD there. The crew quarters is no more than a tiny room off to the side of the apparatus bay. Back then we had eight hour shifts the midnight shift was 2300 to 0700, and in that unit, the EMT unit usually slept on the floor on a futon in the supply room, while the medics got the lazy boy recliner in the main area. There were two computers there to do charts on, and the lazy boy was just off to the side of one of them. One night, Charlene was charting while her partner, Gary, was crashed out on the recliner. For some strange reason, Gary woke up, but was unable to move. He could clearly see Charlene on the computer, but that wasn't all. At the edge of the darkness, just beyond where the light of the monitor illuminated, stood a girl. Gary was in the recliner behind Charlene to her eight o'clock, and the girl was to Charlene's four o'clock. The girl started drifting towards Gary. Her form seemed to move slowly and smoothly across the room without the bobbing or cadence of a walking person. So basically, she was gliding, Gary was still unable to move, but could see the girl disappear from his peripheral vision on his right. Suddenly, the girl's right hand came down upon his. When he felt it, it was pale and cold, and her fingers intertwined with his and slowly pulled his hand upward for a few moments before putting it back down. At this point, Charlene briefly glanced towards Gary, but didn't seem to see anything. So she went back to typing, and Gary eventually went back to sleep. There were no calls for the rest of that night. That morning, Gary was unsure how to go about asking Charlene if she saw anything, so he decided to cast out a lure. I kinda had a weird dream last night, he said. What was it? replied Charlene. He recounted his story, and Charlene told him that she remembered seeing his hand up, but thought he was just doing it in his sleep. When he mentioned the girl, Charlene asked him to describe her. She was Asian, he said, with really white skin and dark hair past her shoulders, I believe. Oh, her, said Charlene very casually. 
she's been following me for the past week. Apparently, Charlene and another medic were sent to do a pronouncement for a suicide. It was either an OD or a hanging, I forget which. At the airport hotel, back when it was the Holiday Inn, Charlene said that while they were there, she saw the girl in the corner of the room. The girl was telling her she made a mistake and did not want to die. On a side note, we actually have a lot of suicides here. It's a shame. A girl from Japan I dated told me that she considered it once, saying that Hawaii was the only place she was ever truly happy and that dying here would be a way to hold on to that happiness. We have a large Asian population living here and suicide is a bit of a taboo subject, which is why it's rarely covered in the news. Despite all the pronouncements and DOAs I've been to, I've never had nightmares or seen ghosts and hopefully it stays that way. I am a 20-year-old college student. I am very brave and courageous, or so I like to believe, and it's not easy to freak me out. But during the year of 2016, an incident happened that changed me for the rest of my life. On 2016, during the month of July, we were about to go into college, and we were very happy to be going. We'd be seeing our friends from high school, and I'd soon be living in a house paying my own rent. I got the house very easily, and I actually got it with a lower rent than I expected. After moving all my things, my bags, books, cloths, etc., into their proper places in my new home, I soon heard a loud banging sound on the main entrance door of my house. I thought it may be a neighbor trying to scare me. I decided to live alone in that house, and maybe they were taking advantage of that. I went back to doing my work, moving all my things in, when soon enough, I heard another loud bang coming from the wall, this time from the washroom. I thought that it may have been the air conditioning turning on, so again, I tried to ignore it. I settled into my new room and I was completely exhausted, so I went to bed early to catch some Zs, but someone doesn't want me to sleep. I heard a noise that sounded like someone crawling around. I stood up from the bed and went outside of my room to check what was there. I was still alone. No one else was in my house, but the door to the washing room is open now, which I knew I had closed before going to sleep. Maybe I was just tired and my mind was playing tricks on me, I tried to tell myself. So I shut my bedroom door and went back to bed. The next morning when I was making coffee, I felt someone grab my shoulder. It scared and startled me at the time, but I have a strong ego and I tried to fight through the fear. But by then, I knew there was something off about this place. College started up fast and I was going from house to school to work at all times of the day. But on one occasion when I returned back to my house, I saw that the floor from the washroom to my bedroom was wet and it looked like someone had crawled from there. What the hell, I thought. I felt goosebumps rise all over my body. At that time, my leg was shivering, like I'd just seen a ghost. That night, I decided to stay with a friend, but I didn't tell him anything. I was too prideful to say anything in front of other people. The next day, everything was going so well. The day had been good for me, I went back to my place that night. I changed into my regular clothes and after putting my night dress on, I immediately felt that something was there in the room with me. Something was staring at me, but there was no one there. I looked around the house. I checked everywhere. I checked the washroom door and I checked the locks. I was perfectly alone and I should have been perfectly safe. I was half asleep when I heard a noise it was a voice whispering to me, and it sounded angry. It repeated what it said over and over, and by the fifth or sixth time, I could tell what it was saying. Leave. There was no way I could sleep after that, and I couldn't stop thinking that I had chose the wrong place to rent. I decided the next morning I would do something about it, even if it meant moving out of this place despite the low rent. 
but around two in the morning, I heard a noise again. This time I heard, I don't want to die. This really confirmed to me that I was dealing with something paranormal, and I was angry. I was angry that something was trying to force me out of my own house. I was so angry that I shouted back at it, just get the hell out. Whoever you are, just go. I won't tell you a second time. After that, there was a long silence. Then a massive and loud, continuous banging sound erupted from all around the house. I had apparently pissed it off. Then I saw a figure, almost my height, solid black like a shadow, standing in the corner of my room. I was shocked and filled with fear. I ran out of my room, only to see a lady standing in the way to the kitchen, and she too was completely covered in shadow. But I grabbed my sleepers and ran for my life outside. I never went back to that room. I don't know what happened to it, and I don't want to know. I quickly found another place to live. But after an experience like this, you start to become a bit too afraid to live alone anywhere. This experience has really changed me. Back in the early 2000s, I played the initial release of MU Online. For those who don't know or remember, MU Online was the prototypical action RPG inspired by Diablo 2. It was back in a simpler time when MMOs weren't all about paying for the best stuff via microtransactions. I know, hard to believe, right? So not long after the Philippine-based players in MU Global were migrated to our own local server here in the Philippines, I joined a guild, as most players do when they start getting serious about the game. It was a ridiculously large guild and was part of an even bigger alliance and surprisingly, a lot of high-level players were in it. It felt really good being accepted into a well-known guild alliance and got to know a vast majority of the players, even though I never actually got to meet them in person. Well, this incident happened around a year after I began playing. While doing our daily grind for XP, me and my friends, Emilie, her brother Oliver, and our friends Genesis and Mike were just talking over the guild alliance chat joking around and all that good stuff. Suddenly, one of our high-level group members came online. I couldn't remember his real name, but nonetheless, we all gave the customary welcome back that we usually do. Oddly enough, he didn't respond to anybody, which was extremely out of character for him. He was a very sociable guy, as well as one of the funniest players in the Guild Alliance, cracking jokes every few minutes or so, we didn't think much of it at the time, and we figured he was probably just in one of those big clusterfucks of enemies. So if he even tried to chat, he would probably get killed really fast. A few minutes later, his player character came waltzing in where we were. Again, we tried to talk to him and greet him, but still, there was no response. He just stuck around for a while, not really getting into the thick of things then just left without a word. Emilie and Mike, who have met him personally in life, said that that was pretty rude and wondered what was going on. You see, he never acted like that, in-game or otherwise. Suddenly, our guild chat began saying the same thing, that he had passed their party, stood around for a while saying nothing, then just left, just now. Oliver said that that was impossible because he was just there seconds ago. This would be perfectly logical if we were all close to each other, but we were maps and worlds apart. It was impossible even with map teleportation because he was apparently near both of our parties at the same time. And before we could ask him what was going on, he just logged off. Fast forward to a week later, and after I logged on to play the game, I was immediately messaged by Genesis. They were asking me if I remembered the incident last week with that player ignoring us. I said yes, and then he dropped a bomb on me. Our friend Mike found out that that player has been dead for over two weeks, 
In fact, they had recently buried him. A few of the high level players who lived close enough to him attended his funeral. I was thinking, how could he have been in the game if he was already dead? Did someone who know his username and password log in for him? We asked around in the Guild Alliance chat and got decisive confirmation that no one knew his account details, not even his closest friends and family in the Guild or in real life. Maybe it was his ghost logging in from the afterlife to look around and see his friends one more time. We never did get an answer and it still unnerves some of us to this day, over 15 years later.